Now, we've been in Jonah for a couple of weeks, and you probably know in the back of your mind that most scholars and skeptics pretty much believe Jonah is a myth, or at best, a parable, some kind of fable meant to communicate religious truth, like Aesop's fables or the great myths of ancient Greece and stuff like that. Uh, Y'all know I don't believe that. I think the Bible is God's word. It's perfect, infallible, without error. It's, it's good. And so we can trust it and believe that even when it doesn't match up with our understanding of the way the world works, God's ways are higher than ours and his thoughts are higher than our, ours. So that's the way I view it. But recently, uh, all those scholars and skeptics have had to deal with some facts, uncomfortable facts, facts that are, as they say, stranger than fiction. Because just last month, on June 11th, it was a Friday morning, a veteran lobsterman, okay, a guy that dives down under the ocean to catch lobsters, was swallowed by a whale off the coast of Massachusetts, Provincetown, Massachusetts. His name was Michael Packard, and I got this article from the Cape Cod Times. Several of you have mentioned it and sent it to me, so I thank you for that. This is how he says it happened, okay? He dove down. He was going about 40 feet down to catch some lobsters, and when he thought he was about 30 or 35 feet, all of a sudden, I felt this huge shove, and the next thing I know, I'm completely black. I'm completely inside the whale. It was completely black. I thought to myself, there's no way I'm getting out of here. I'm done. I'm dead. A humpback whale came through that spot where Michael Packard was catching lobsters and swallowed him up. That's amazing. There were men all around. They saw it. You know, we read the book of Jonah, and we feel a little apologetic, like, I'm sorry. I know this isn't supposed to be the way things work. I know people are not supposed to get swallowed by fish and live in there for days at a time, but that's what the Bible says. You've got to believe it. But then God gives us a perfect little gift, an example of a person in real life, not back in the 1800s when they made stuff up left and right, but in the real world, a man got swallowed by a fish. Now, full disclosure, he was probably only in the whale's mouth, and it lasted maybe only 30 or 40 seconds. But it's definitely a life-altering experience for that guy. Can you imagine? Everywhere Michael Packard goes for the rest of his life, they're going to say, hey, tell us about the time you got swallowed by a whale. You know, and he's going to have to go through it again. His grandkids and great-grandkids are going to be known as the grandkids and great-grandkids, the guy that got swallowed by a whale. And I bet you have an experience like that. You know, maybe not getting swallowed by a fish or being attacked by um, African hornets or anything crazy to be dealing with the animal kingdom. But you've experienced some stuff in your life that changed everything. In a moment, you went from not being the certain person to being the person you are today. Life-altering circumstances, the likes of which you can't explain your life without including. Michael Packard's the guy who got swallowed by the whale, just like Jonah is a guy who got swallowed by a great fish. I mean, think about him. For thousands of years, the only thing we think about Jonah is he's the prophet that got swallowed by the fish. Kids know him as Jonah and the whale, uh, alongside Noah and the ark, and they even sometimes get those confused, Jonah and the ark and Noah and the whale and all that. But there are events in our lives that change things, that alter our existence in unmistakable ways, things that are without a doubt, page turners in our life story. And this morning, as we think about Jonah's time spent in this fish, I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. What circumstances and life events have changed everything about you? Apart from them, you can't tell the story of your life. Because here's the deal. Uh, We think of Jonah's time in the fish as the defining moment of his life, but it really wasn't. It was just an opportunity that God used to get through to him. Jonah's time in the fish gave him a whole new experience of God. God's grace and his character and his desire to do good to his people. And as I've prepared it this week, it's become obvious to me that this passage, which is really a prayer, is really about proving to us that God can take our darkest circumstances and redeem them for his glory and for our good. And so that's what I want you to see this morning, that God can redeem your darkest circumstances for his glory and our good. So if you do have your Bible, you're probably open to John 1, uh, Jonah 117 already. And uh, Jonah 117 is actually verse 1 of chapter 2 in the Hebrew Bible. So we're just going to start there. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. 
And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord, and he answered me. I cried for help from the depth of Sheol, and you heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I've been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I'll look again towards your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. So this is the story of Jonah in the belly of the fish. Uh, clearly, it's the focal point of our thinking about the book. We, we tend to just pull it all together and say Jonah's the guy who got swallowed by a whale. But in what we just read, you saw, right? Did you see it? The whale seems to be the focal point of our mind, but he's really just a bookend to the real story of what's happening. Right? He, he's introduced. We're told that God appointed a whale or a great fish to swallow Jonah in chapter 1, verse 17. And then later in the end of chapter 2, we're told that God commanded the fish to vomit Jonah out onto dry land. But the fish is not the main point of the story. Like we saw before, uh, God is. The story's not about Jonah. The story's not about fish. It's about the God who called Jonah and pursued him on the sea. He, he's the one who's driving the action. He appoints and he commands. You know, we, the fish gets the attention for us because it's the bizarre and the miraculous and the strange. But the narrator of the book of Jonah, whether it's Jonah or somebody else, is totally fine to take a pause in the action. He doesn't include vivid details about the whale or fish's appearance or species even. We think it's a whale, but who knows? It might have been one of those Goliath groupers that people pull up from the bottom of the sea. Who knows what kind of fish it was? It's not the point of the story. There's something else going on. The fish is just a subplot to what God is doing in Jonah's life. So the narrator is glad to interrupt the flow of the story, the flow of the details of the narration, and to insert Jonah's prayer, which is, I, I think, one of the more beautiful and poetic prayers you'll find in all of Scripture. It seems totally out of place from the rest of the book. Jonah chapter 1 is a real fast-paced narrative. Jonah did this, this happened, et etc. et cetera. And chapters 3 and 4 pick up the pace again, where we get back to Jonah and Nineveh and what God does through him and all that. It's great. But it's like the narrator inserts this prayer and presses pause so that we have to think slowly and deeply about what's really going on. You might have to think back to your high school English class to the last time you've ever sat down and read poetry. Right? But I heard a definition of poetry one time that really stuck with me. Poetry is saying something true beautifully. We get caught up in the rhyming sequence and the uh, you know, different meter, iambic pentameter, and all that stuff. But that's not the point. The point is the message that's being communicated. And because we tend to just operate in cliches and turns of phrases, poetry forces out us out of our standard way of speaking so that we have to sit there and think about something. And that's the way biblical poetry works as well. It, it forces us to think long and hard about some aspect of God, his character, or the way he works in the world. And Hebrew poetry is especially this way because it repeats itself. They call it uh, parallelism, where one line echoes the line that came before as it focuses our attention in on this one thing. And if you tried to summarize what it is that Jonah wants us to focus on in this poetic prayer, it has to be God's act of salvation and Jonah's response of thanksgiving for it. In fact, I, you could just take this prayer out and put it into the Psalms, and it would be right at home. It fits the standard form of what we call a psalm of thanksgiving. There is an introductory uh, praise of God, 
an expression of loving gratitude. And then it has a recounting, a short account of the situation from which the psalmist has been rescued. And finally, it has a thanksgiving for God's redemption. And that's exactly what this psalm has. It has an introduction, it has a recounting of the events of Jonah's life, and then it has the final exclamation of praise. And if you take it together, what the psalm forces us to do is to really stop and consider the miraculous salvation that God worked for Jonah. And it does it by forcing us to see two things. The first is Jonah's desperate situation. Jonah's desperate situation. We think about last week when we left off with Jonah, he was sinking beneath a turbulent sea and uh, disappearing beneath the waves. It, it didn't get better for him. It wasn't like some sea monster came up and saved him. It wasn't quite like that. Instead, Jonah says in chapter 2, 3, You'd cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. The current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. In verse 5, he said, Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. It swallowed me up. Weeds were wrapped around my head. You get the picture, don't you? Jonah is not hanging out in some clear crystal blue water, snorkeling and looking at the, the animal life. He's dying. He's being crushed by the tremendous weight of the water above him. The currents are pulling him left and right. You can imagine him fighting to get to the surface to get a gasp of air, but the waves are rowing, and the wind is blowing, and the rain is falling, and, and finally he just sort of collapses into the ocean and almost just surrenders himself to death. I mean, he is in a desperate situation, a situation none of us would want to be. And as he sinks to the, to the bottom of the, to the ocean floor, and the weeds start to wrap around him, he has this recognition that his desperate physical situation wasn't near as bad as his desperate spiritual situation. And so he offered up just a quick prayer to God. I imagine it said something like, God, save me. God, you're going to have to do something. I'm powerless underneath the ocean. You have found me. You have punished me. You've left me here to die, but you're good, and I'm trusting you to save me. Save me. And somehow, the arrow makes it from the bottom of the ocean all the way to God's ears, and he does. He saves him. He sends a fish along to swallow him up so that Jonah doesn't drown and is instead preserved in this fish. See, the spiritual situation for Jonah was the real point. Uh, Jonah, in verse 7, says he remembered the Lord. He remembered the Lord. I think there's got to be some irony here. That's another literary device that's supposed to force us to see something different. The irony is that you'll remember back in chapter 1, Jonah got a word from God. Uh, Arise, go to that great city Nineveh, and call out against it, for its wickedness has come up before me. And the narrator tells us that Jonah got up to flee from the presence of the Lord. Jonah's been running from God, this whole story. And all at once, as he's wrapped up in seaweed, he realizes he's just about to get what he asked for. God's just about to let him get the answer to his heart's desire. Here he was, the bottom of the ocean, clinging to life. But he was about as far away from God as any one person could ever be. Here he was, he says, knocking on death's door. If he died now, he'd be confirmed in his rebellion and in his disobedience. I mean, he even used key words to clue us into this spiritual mindset. He uses the word sheol, which in the Old Testament is the Hebrew concept of the afterlife, sometimes associated just with the place where people are buried, but often with this place where the wicked go after death until judgment. He's afraid he's going to be cast away, separated from God's presence forever with the wicked. He says that God brought him up from the pit. The pit is associated with the putrid remains of decomposing flesh. Nowhere anybody wants to be. If Jonah died in this spiritual condition, he'd be locked away from the presence of the Lord forever, just as he had desired. And he realized he didn't want to have any part of that. He didn't want to be apart from God. He wanted to be near him again. He wanted to go into his presence in the temple. He wanted to offer sacrifices of praise. He's like the guy in Psalm 42. I remember how I used to praise you and lead the procession as we worshiped joyfully before you. I want to do that again. Give me a reason to praise. 
And so in emphasizing Jonah's desperate spiritual and physical condition, it forces us to see what a person gets when they live apart from God. And yet it also forces us to see, number two, the faithfulness of Yahweh. I mean, Jonah's psalm begins with this introduction to his prayer of thanksgiving. And he says in verse 2 that the Lord heard his prayer. Whatever it was, God saved me or helped me or something like that, God heard it. He answered. He sent the fish and saved Jonah from death. And from Jonah's perspective, you've got to believe that this is nothing short of miraculous. I mean, he, he, there's no hope for him. He knows it. He's, he's drowning. Who ever thought... Uh, just think about this with me. Whoever, when they're drowning, thinks, well, maybe God will send a fish to swallow me up and save me. No, you're like Michael Packard. All of a sudden, there was a huge shove, and then I was totally engulfed in darkness, and I thought, I'm going to die. Jonah's like, I'm dying at the bottom of the ocean, and now I'm getting swallowed by a fish. What's up? I thought you were going to save me. But that's exactly what God did. Miraculously, unexpectedly, at the very moment that Jonah's life was slipping away, he acted. He heard his prayer, and he answered him. And to me, it's got to be nothing less than a clear affirmation of what the Bible teaches us over and over and over and over again. Our God saves, and he's faithful to his people. Jonah says it down in verses 8 and 9. He says, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Salvation is from the Lord. Salvation is from Yahweh. The turnaround for Jonah is huge. It's the page turner, the circumstance that he can't define his life without mentioning. Before, he was a rebellious prophet. Afterwards, he's singing God's praises. I mean, from the beginning of the story, Jonah's been on this journey. Uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, but I think it's pretty interesting. In, in Jonah 1.3, it says that Jonah went down to Joppa. And when he bought his fare for passage to Tarshish, he went down into the ship. In Jonah 2.6, he says that he went down to the depths of the sea. And when he finally reached rock bottom, he went down, 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 and he can't go down any farther. He says, you brought me up. It's a reversal of trajectory, not just physically, but spiritually. Jonah's been running from God, and God intervened and brought him back. Might not have been the most comfortable vehicle for salvation. Got any submarines? That'd be better. But it was better than the alternative. And that's the way God normally works, which we're going to get to in a second, so I won't steal my thunder. But the God who sent Jonah to the depths had remained faithful. The same God who sent him there sent the fish to rescue him. And so despite Jonah's sin and the punishment that he deserved, Yahweh graciously acted faithfully to his faithless prophet. And, and you can't get much more beautiful and poetic than that. If you were going to distill the biblical principle, I think you could say something like this. It doesn't matter how far you go or how fast you run, you can't escape the faithful love of God. Just let that sink over you, because that's not even my sermon. But this is where it hits home for me. That I'm likely never to be swallowed by a fish. That's, I'm not a lobsterman, and I'm not a rebellious prophet. I'm not going to be at the bottom of an ocean crying desperately for help. But there are circumstances in my life that have radically changed who I am as a person. As a pastor, as a husband, as a dad, there are things that I, at the time I wish I wasn't going through, but they have shaped me to be the person I am. And, and this is what I want you to know if you've got stories like that in your life, that God redeemed Jonah's experience for Jonah's good. Okay, and I want to show you what I mean by this. Is that before Jonah gets swallowed by a fish, he is the epitome of of rebellion. He heard a clear word from God, and he decided in his heart that he was going to do the exact opposite thing from what that word commanded him. He's running as fast and as far as he can. After he gets vomited out on dry land, he gets to God's business and goes to Nineveh and preaches the word that God told him to preach. That's chapter 3, and we're going to see it next week. But in between was this very real, very personal brush with death. And that changes a person. Before his journey to the gates of death, I, I think Jonah had what we might call a doctrinal knowledge of God. He knew true theological facts about him. We know this because when the sailors ask him in chapter 1, who are you and what God do you serve? He says, I serve the Lord, the creator of heavens and earth, the Lord of sand and sea, or however you want to put it. I serve the God who created all things. 
So he had some doctrinal knowledge of God. God is the creator. He's in charge of this world. We're just living in it. You could even say he had a covenantal knowledge of God. I am a Hebrew. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I belong to the people of Israel, God's chosen race. We have the law and the covenants. We are better than y'all because we know him on a real one-to-one relational basis. But here's the deal. I'm not convinced, and I don't see any evidence in Jonah in chapter 1 to prove me otherwise. I'm not convinced that Jonah had what's most important when it comes to knowledge of God. And that is a personal, experiential knowledge of him. He knew facts about him. He knew facts in relation to the people of God. But he didn't personally know the grace of God. But you can best believe that as he sank to the bottom of the ocean, he realized he was there because of his sin, and if God acted to save him, it wasn't going to be because of anything good in Jonah. It was going to be because of God. And so that's what I think God wants us to see for our broken experiences. That the transformation that happened for Jonah, where before he's rebellious and afterward he's obedient, took a pretty severe brush with death. And God redeemed it for Jonah's good. I think God wants to redeem our broken circumstances for our good. He wants to bring us through fiery trials so that he can purify the gold and remove the dross. He wants to give us a greater understanding of his grace and of his character. He wants us to really know beyond cliches and Sunday school answers who he is. Not from a textbook or from the scriptures, but from real life lived experience. He wants us to use the darkest circumstances of our life to remake us into the people we're supposed to be. And I think if you think about it, and I challenge you to think about it, think about the story of your life, we grow the most through life's hardest circumstances. And I remember in my my own life, five, six years ago, struggling with God, thinking I had a perfect plan for my life, but it didn't match up with his. And I was angry about it. I was bitter. I was miserable so bad my wife had to call me out on it every day. Brad, you're a grown man. You can't wake up on the wrong side of the bed. But I was. I was so angry. I was so bitter, so full of self-pity. I even told her one night, I feel like God has abandoned me. But he hadn't. Of course he hadn't. I was living disobediently and rebelliously, trying to dictate terms to the God who made me. And after several months of that, finally I'd had enough. I woke up from my senses, realized that he was teaching me what it means to live surrendered, to let him dictate what I do and where I go. In the moment, the process was horrible, and you can think to your circumstances. You wouldn't wish him on your worst enemy. But after the fact, you know God so much differently than you did before. You know him on a personal, experiential level. I, can't, I don't look, just look at my wife and say, hey, God's got our, he, he knows where we're going. He knows what we're doing. He knows all the circumstances of our kids' lives. We don't have to worry about those things because I've lived it. I've personally experienced God being in control of my life and me submitting myself to him and living surrendered and following him wherever he leads and wherever he goes, I go right behind him. That's what I gained from my darkest season of the night. And I know that that's what God wants for you. I know it. The Bible says it. Count it joy when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Nothing comes into your life, no matter how hard it is, without God intending to redeem it for your good. That's what the Bible tells us. So I don't know what trials you're facing. I don't know what all you've been through. I do know that they can be pretty dark. Personal loss, health crisis, Broken heart for your kids, for your families, financial uncertainty, whatever. I don't know how bad, but it doesn't matter how bad it is. That God can redeem it for your good and to use it in your life to shape you more into the image of Jesus. I'll give you another example. Bobby Clinton was a former Marine Corps officer, pastor, and professor at Fuller Seminary in California. And he wrote a book called The Making of a Leader. And in that book, he analyzed the lives of hundreds of real-world leaders and biblical leaders. You know what he discovered? That the leaders who made a real impact could divide their life into multiple seasons. In the first major half of their life, God was at work in them, shaping them to be the person he wanted to be. And then after that, God could work through them. 
But he had to work in them first before he could work through them. And I got to believe that that's the way these dark experiences work for us. That God uses them to work in us, to reshape us, to refine our heart's desires so that he can use us and work through us later on. I know that because the Bible is full of these examples. I mean, you think about Abraham. I'm a Hebrew, a descendant of Abraham. And you think about the darkness of that man's life. He's an old man without children. He's going to leave all his possessions to a servant, Eliezer of Damascus. And God shows up and says, no, I'm going to give you a son. And Sarah laughs, of course, because she's near 100 years old and can't have children. And so they decide to solve the problem on their own, take God's plan into their own hands. And you know the story of Hagar and the terrible destruction that follows between the violence of Esau and Jacob. But you, you think about this situation, how God took Abraham and Sarah, a barren couple, and transformed them into the, the, the head of an entire race of people, God's chosen people. You think about Jacob, who served year after year after year for his father-in-law Laban. And when finally, when God was ready to bring him back and use him to establish his covenant people, Israel, in the land, God met up with him, and he wrestled with him, and he touched him on the thigh bone, whatever that means, and left Jacob with a hip the rest of his life. He had to get the trickster out of him and show him who was in charge. You think about Paul. I mean, on his own, Paul was an incredibly bright man. Uh, I, I read the other day somewhere that they used to require, I don't know if they still do, they used to require second-year law students at Harvard Law School to read the book of Romans because of the precision of its argumentation. Lawyers need to know how to argue, and Paul knew how to argue as the best of them. But before God could use Paul to write books in the New Testament and to found churches all over the world, he had to blind him first. Call out to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And get this, even after Saul had his sight restored, when he got on track with Jesus, for the rest of his life he carried with him a thorn in the flesh that most people think was a, a nagging eye ailment. ailment. And after asking the Lord time and time and time and time again, God, remove this thorn in the flesh from me. Let me get over the pain of my past. Jesus said, no. My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. So listen, brother, sister. Life can be tough, dark. Feel that you're clinging on to life by threads. But don't miss what God might be doing in you through your darkest experiences. He wants to redeem them. He wants to use them. He's working in you so he can work through you. We clearly see it in Jonah's life. But then number two, God redeemed Jonah's experience for Jonah's good, and he redeemed Jonah's experience for his own glory. And I think the conclusion to Jonah's prayer drives that home for me like a giant exclamation point. Salvation is from Yahweh. Shal salvation is from the Lord. This is, for the first time, Jonah's personal acknowledgement of the Bible's most basic truth, that God saves. That's it. That's, that's what the Bible's all about. God is saving a people for his own possession through the death of his son Jesus from every nation, tribe, and language. That's what God's up to in the world, and Jonah finally clues into it. Salvation's from God. See, the God who created our world, he promises salvation to all who turn to him in faith. And I think before this point, Jonah had no clue about that theoretically, doctrinally, covenantally, but not personally. But after the fact, Jonah turns to praise. In fact, I like the way one commentator, Leslie Allen, put it. He said, deliverance obligates praise. And that's what Jonah turns to. After God saves him to the fish, he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. What I have vowed, I'll pay. I'm going to show up at church, and I'm going to lay my sacrifices before you because you are good, and you alone can save. That is... Jonah's purpose by the end of his prayer. And it's the purpose for which God created the whole world. He created all things to bring him praise. The Psalms tell us, the heavens declare the glory of God, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Jesus says, if we refuse to praise him, even the rocks are going to cry out. Everything in all creation, from the smallest atom to the largest planet, exists for the glory of God. But sometimes, it takes some pretty dark stuff for us to realize it. Sometimes you got to get brought real low before you realize how good and awesome God is. Because there's no reason for some of us to be where we are today. We're like Jonah. Maybe not at the bottom of the sea, 
But we've been through some stuff. And if God hadn't have showed up, we wouldn't be here. And that's what Jonah realizes. He, he turns around from complaining and self-pity and running from God to being his number one fan. Salvation belongs to the Lord. You think about other instances where God takes really dark situations and turns them around for praise. And you think of the phrases from the Old Testament. He exchanges our ashes for beauty. Our brokenness, our shame. He takes it all away and clothes us in pure white garments of righteousness. Oh, this is the way God always works. He takes something that's broken and seemingly irredeemable and he dresses it up to bring him praise. The prime example of this, of course, though, is the death of Jesus. And, and you think long and hard about what that must have been like for Jesus' first disciples. I mean, to live with him for three and a half years and to observe his daily interactions with people, the way he taught, the way he spoke, the way he loved people, the way he worked miracles, opening blind people's eyes and helping people who can't walk, walk, and all the wonderful things that Jesus accomplished. And they had to think in the back of their mind that this is as good as it could get. Lord, let me, just, let me just come into your presence now. I've seen it all. This is as good as I could possibly ever hope for. And then he starts talking crazy talk. That he's been walking away from Jerusalem, and now he's going to turn back towards Jerusalem. And when he gets there, he's going to be met by hostile crowds who are going to turn him over to the hands of lawless men and crucify him. And when they get to Jerusalem, of course, it's just like Jesus said it was going to be. Of course, there are the kids running around. Hosanna, Hosanna, blesses the son of David, blesses he who comes in the name of the Lord. But over in the corner are those who are plotting against him. And eventually, they persuade one of his own disciples to betray him. And so Jesus is handed over to the religious leaders, and he's put on mock trial. And they beat him. And then they make him carry his own cross outside the city gates where they crucify him before the public. And then those disciples who loved him, who would have literally followed him anywhere or done anything for him, have to take their master's body off the cross and bury it in a tomb. How dark is that? Your whole life dreams tied up in this man, and here's his lifeless body. It was so disorienting for some of them that they immediately just went home. They started their, their, their seven-mile walk out of town, Back to their lives, hey, we thought Jesus was the one, but our hopes are dashed. That's dark. But while the darkness pervaded the world, God was working behind the scenes. And when it looked like all hope was lost, God raised Jesus up again. And that's the way God works. When things seem to be at their worst, when Jonah's at the gates of hell and the weeds are wrapped around his head, and all hope is lost, God arrives. Help arrives. God hears his prayer and acts. And when Jesus is laid in the tomb, just as he said he would, and this generation is perverted, it wants a sign, but this is the only sign it's going to get, the sign of Jonah. For just as this Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, so too will the Son of Man be in the belly of the earth for three days and rise again. And that's what happened. Jesus was there, and he came out again. The dark end that everybody worried about, was overturned. Jesus demonstrated God's power over death, over hell and the grave, and he worked to break the power of sin over everybody's life who trusts in him. And because of that, God raised him up and gave him a seat of honor, the name above every name, so that Jesus would receive all the glory. So that's what God does. He takes broken, messed up, suffering situations and he wraps them up in his loving embrace. And on the other side is something that turns out for our good and for his glory. Friend, if he can raise Jesus from the dead and save a rebellious prophet through the miraculous arrival of a giant fish, there are no circumstances in your life that God cannot redeem for your good and for his glory. I mean, it's obvious to me. Jonah experienced it, and you can too. He wouldn't have been the prophet he becomes in chapter 3 without the brush with death in chapter 2. And it's probable that the dark circumstances that you're facing or have faced are the means that God intends to use to change you to be the person he wants to use. And so I encourage you, like I did like five years ago, confess your bitterness and your anger and hurt to God. 
over what you've been through. You know, God didn't abandon you. His plans were different than your plans, and he brought you through a path that maybe you wouldn't have chosen for yourself. But because we know all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose, we know that his plans for you are better than your plans for you. He wants to conform you into the image of Jesus, and he's going to do it, whether you like it or not. And so offer yourself to him. Say, Lord, I will do, or I will go wherever you would have me to do. Or maybe like Jonah, you need to cry out to God for salvation. I love it. Salvation comes from the Lord as like the tattoo that everybody ought to go out today and get. We've got to remind ourselves of it every day. Salvation belongs to God. Salvation belongs to God. Salvation belongs to God. But here's the danger of something that is so rote for many of us. We lose the wonder of what that really means. That salvation belongs to God and he freely gives it to those who ask for it. I mean, have you personally experienced that? The redeeming grace of God that comes to people who are alienated by their own sin from him. And if not, today is the day you need to do that. I mean, have you experienced? I love the way Psalm 103 puts it, that bless the Lord of my soul comes from. He says, uh, he redeems your life from the pit. He heals all your diseases. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Are you living that way? Are you crowned with steadfast love and mercy? Do you know that the salvation of God follows you wherever you go? Well, today, if you don't, today is the day that you can know that. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the favorable time. Anyone today who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved, and he's the only one who can do it. Brad Mills sure can't save anybody. I preach my guts out. I try my best. I plead with you with everything in me and by the Spirit of God, but I am powerless in the face of your sin. But God is not. He can take it, and he can remove it, and he can set you free to live for him. And it just may be that it takes these circumstances to help you see it. That you're no hope for yourself. Nobody in the world can save you. You're going to have to have some kind of miraculous, divine intervention. And perhaps that's exactly what God wants to do today. Y'all pray with me.